that with everyone after the today's call. Great. Um, well, hello, everyone, and happy Wednesday. Welcome to our conversation project community call. I hope that you are all having a great week. My name is Chrissy Cronin, and I will be your WebEx host for today's call. While we're waiting for everyone to join us, I'd like to run through a few WebEx tips and tricks. If you can hear my voice right now, you have connected successfully. If you would like to change your audio preferences, please click the audio and video tab at the top of your screen and click switch audio. You can also find this by clicking the mute unmute button at the bottom of your screen. And if you have a question or comment at any point during today's call, feel free to type that into the chat box. The way to do that is by selecting the chat bubble that is at the bottom right of your screen. Once you click on this, the chat box will open up. To send a public message, write your message at the bottom of your screen and send it to everyone. You can also use the raise your hand icon, which is located on the right hand side above the chat, and we'll call on you to voice your question. If you're having any technical difficulties, please chat to host myself, Chrissy Cronin, and I will help you. We're going to take a moment to get things started in the chat. Please type into the chat box your name, location, and organization, and make sure to send your message to everyone. Wonderful. Wow, great. Wonderful, looks like we have a great group with us today and continue writing into the chat as we move along. Before we dive in, we want to know where people are joining us from. To get a sense of where we're all located, please point to where you're calling in from on the map. To do this, you will find a squiggly line on the um, left hand side of your screen. Oh, okay. Click on that squiggly line and navigate to the <laughs> arrow key in the, on the left hand side of your screen, right above the WebEx presentation you're currently viewing. Click the arrow key and then click on the map where you're located. And just a reminder, um, if you're not speaking, to please put yourself on mute. Do you see North Carolina, Florida, Washington, Iowa? Wonderful. Good. We have a great group with us today. Okay, so with that, I'll turn things over to Patty Webster, advisor for the Conversation Project. Take it away, Patty. For the talking on mute, you would think after how long um, we <laughs> unmute ourselves. Um, so, hello, everybody. Um, this is Patty, and thank you so much, Chrissy, and thank you all for joining us. I am just super thrilled um, to see so many people. I know folks are still rolling in. Uh, but I'm ex so excited because we haven't had one of these calls in a long time. Um, and so I feel like the band is back together and I see some, a lot of familiar names and faces and I see so many new ones and I'm really um, excited to, to get us together and get us started. Um, so I'm going to see, let me see if I can, Chrissy, do I have the ball? Yes, if you hit your, um, yeah, yep, there you go, you. perfect. Okay, thank you. My, my pointer was doing some odd things. How do I turn my pointer off? That is the question. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, so um, I wanted to just welcome everybody, but also recognize that we are in obviously unprecedented times. Um, we haven't done these calls in a little while because we recognized the Zoom fatigue, Zoom webinar, Teams, whatever the virtual platform is you're using. Um, and so we, we, we're getting this back together because we have this annual call. It's extremely important and really near and dear to our hearts. It's all about NHGD and planning. Um, but before we jump in, I want to recognize that um, there's been a lot of storms to be weathered. 
um, over the last year or two, um, figuratively and literally. And so what I'm going to do is ask us, you, we're going to use chat heavily. So I'm going to ask you in chat, how are you showing up today? So what is your mental weather today? So for instance, um, I'm feeling a little bit foggy. Um, I'm, I, I live in Abu Dhabi, um, so the time for me is 9 p.m. I was up at 4.30 a.m. Uh, running a workshop uh, in, with groups that I work with in Australia. So my brain's a little foggy, so that's kind of how I'm showing up today. So I invite you to share your mental weather in chat with us today to see how folks are doing. All right, I like that there's a little sun peeking through that cloud, Tony. <laughs> oh, I like the, okay, someone's feeling groovy, Elise, I love it. Elizabeth, hello from Costa Rica. I'm excited to see you here. <laughs> Chocolate ice cream for lunch, Kate. I think that's, um, I think that's pretty hot. <laughs> Cold. Right, so people are feeling pretty sunny, partly cloudy. Sunny with a side of coffee. I love that one there. And thank you, Elizabeth. After my own totally appreciate yeah, exactly. I, I appreciate that you're sharing, Elizabeth, that feeling overwhelmed, but good to be part of the group again. <laughs> Eve, I hope by the end of the call, we, we defrost you a little bit. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you all for sharing that. It, it's important for us to just uh, understand where everyone's coming from and before we jump into the content. But I'm going to go ahead now and start uh, just sharing a little bit about who we are um, and what we're going to do this, uh, this next 54 minutes with you all on the line. So here's a quick hit agenda. So um, I'm going to just give a brief, uh, very brief update of who the conversation project. So other TCP is our acronym. If you're not familiar with us, um, some of you may not be familiar with who we are and what we do. So I'll give you a quick little update on that. Those that are familiar, I'm going to show um, some updated resources that we have for you um, and just um, give you a little bit of a recap of what's been going on since the last time we had these calls. And then we're going to jump right into what is National Healthcare Decisions Day um, and what me um, thoughts about what, what you all might be doing, what you might be planning, um, or what questions you might have. And then the crux of our call, we're really going to, um, I'm just super excited to hear um, some learning around recent messaging research um, that we have that's going to help us approach um, national healthcare decisions this year, but also I think the work in, in every, every capacity of what we do. Um, and we're then going to um, continue with sharing plans and networking. This call is really about um, looking on the chat and really making sure you're seeing and making connections with folks who um, you want to connect with after the call and during the call. And then we're going to leave in action and do a little bit of um, share what we're planning for National Healthcare Decisions Day um, as the conversation project uh, and, and leave you some thoughts about what you uh, may be able to do in, um, in service of, of this day uh, with us. And so I'm going to ask um, that I, I'm going to keep mentioning this because I am uh, you all that have been on these calls know um, that we use this chat heavily. Feel free to pop in any comments, any questions, any thoughts. Um, if you see someone who is in your neck of the woods from some of the introductions earlier that you want to say hello to or connect with, Go ahead and do that in chat. I'm very open with you doing that throughout the whole call. You don't have to wait. Um, so make this call yours and really uh, take advantage of the time together. And so um, the conversation project, uh, we are a national initiative. Um, we, we are housed in the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. We are a project under the IHI. Um, we are the, the public facing arm and, and we really focus on community work to help people share their wishes for care through the end of life. Early and often, we joke that we should have been named the Conversations Project because it is not just one. It is, it is an ongoing uh, continuum of conversations um, throughout your lifespan. And so um, the work that we do, um, we have resources free for all um, to be adapted and used as you wish. Um, and those are housed on our website. So if you haven't seen this yet, 
Um, I, I encourage you to check it out. The, what I've circled there are different tabs that you can explore. And so as an individual, if you're just looking for resources to share with um, your person or someone who's important to you in your life, you go to the Get Started tab, and that's where most of our, uh, our guides live uh, that I'll show you. But if you look across there, if you're really, um, what I'm assuming most of you all are community members looking to share this, maybe outside of your personal circle, maybe in a social circle or in a, in a community circle, state, national level, um, that Get Involved tab is really uh, your best friend for resources that you can use and adapt. Also, we've got a tab on NHDD and everything that we have um, for that day are, are, is all located there. These are our guides, and I, I'm assuming most of you are familiar uh, with those, but if not, uh, we have guides for all different types of conversations to really help jumpstart them. These have been adapted, and so last year in 2021, we adapted them based on the latest messaging research, and so um, they are also editable right now. So you can go in and you can edit uh, because we have a Creative Commons license, so you can change and tweak the language, what's best for those that you're working with, um, and to support them. They're in multiple languages, and we've got audio forms as well. Um, we also, whoop, we also, I think my slides have gone a little wonky. I don't know if I did anything. Um, have two tools that we worked in conjunction with Ariadne Labs uh, with. So one was a two-page guide on the right-hand side of being prepared in COVID, and one is this What Matters to Me workbook. Uh, that workbook is really focused on individuals who have been recently diagnosed or diagnosed with a serious illness and want to think about what really matters to them. Um, we just came out, so those were updated based on research that Ariana was doing to see if those guides were resonating. They, uh, we worked together with them to update them based on what um, lay people in the field were telling us. And the newest that is now available is this guide in Chinese. So we're so excited to have us, uh, the guide in Chinese, English, and Spanish. And as new translations come uh, about, we'll let you know about that. So I'm just kind of running through these guides real quickly so we can get to the meat of the call, some of our resources. The one thing I will point you to, if you haven't yet seen it, some of you may have been familiar with this, we sent a blog out um, at the end of 2021, beginning of, of this year. This is a recap. This blog has a whole host of resources that were new um, and some of those that were favorite resources that people keep coming to our site uh, time and time again for. Uh, it's broken up in the top resources for individuals looking for resources to help muted. them. And then resources uh, for those of you who are engaging with your community. And so, uh, Chrissy, I don't know, did I do something funky with the slides? Can everybody see that? Change the. Can you see the whole? I have to arrow down for the slides. I'm not sure if I did something wrong. See your 2021 um, recap. Okay, but you can, can you see the whole slide on the screen or is it just me? Yep, I can see the whole slide. Okay, perfect. Yes, perfect. I'm sorry, folks. I just did something with my, my vision. So these guides here, um, are, I would encourage you to check that out because we, we created a lot of new content. Um, again, everything we create is, is yours to use, adapt, um, and um, reuse as, as you wish. I'm going to point to this guide in the blue, how to have conversations with older adults about what matters. This is the latest that we worked with, and we do this often, we work with other groups. Um, Age Friendly is a, a whole initiative that's going on with a ton of partners, um, thank you, Kate, across um, the US and internationally. Um, we worked with them to create a guide specifically for those that are working with older adults to help them, so for clinicians or uh, those in senior care, assisted living, people who are working with adults wanting to jumpstart conversations. And so that guide um, can be helpful uh, to help those that are in those settings to jumpstart that. So I, I would, wanted to point that out to you. We do this often is that we partner with people and we work with folks. And that is really how it came about um, that we had this wonderful union with the National Healthcare Decisions Day movement that uh, we now house and we host, but we certainly did not start it. And we are so honored today to have Nathan Kotkamp, um, who is the founder and chair of National Healthcare Decisions Day with us. And so Nathan is going to um, share, I'm going to do a better introduction uh, to you, Nathan, but he's going to share a little bit about what is National Healthcare Decisions Day, what it is now, and, and potentially um, he's going to share his elevator pitch. This is something that you can use to help spread the word uh, with others on what is NHDD. Um, Nathan is not only the founder and chair of NHDD, let me pop this picture here, and we're going to see him live in just a second. Um, he's a healthcare partner with Williams and Mullen, and so he's located in Virginia. So anyone in Virginia, shout out to Nathan. 
Um, he has deep background in bioethics, and so he sits on numerous hospital um, ethics committees, but he's also a member of the Advanced Directives Task Force Committee of the Supreme Court of the Virginia Commission on Mental Health Law Reform, um, among lots of other uh, things that, that Nathan has done. Um, and so, Nathan, thank you so much for joining us, and I'm going to pass it to you to give us a, a rundown of what is National Healthcare Decisions Day. Awesome. Thanks, Patty. I'm hoping everyone can hear me at this point. Um, uh, the initiative National Healthcare Decisions Day uh, it is true. It was founded by me back in my younger and even more naive days when I didn't realize what I was creating. Um, but I want to emphasize the fact that it belongs to you guys. Uh, National Healthcare Decisions Day is purely and simply a grassroots initiative. Um, it is all about what you decide to do in your communities, in your uh, facilities, within your own homes. Um, so there is no protocol, there is no requirement, there's no agenda. What it is, is what you decide to do with it. Um, just by way of just real high level background, uh, the, the initiative did start uh, out of my work with bioethics, particularly in sitting on several hospital ethics committees where I was seeing the lack of advanced care planning be the driver of most of the ethics consults that we had. And so I tried to address the issue with a two prong approach. One was for the public and the other is for providers. And, and the whole notion is let's all try and beat the drum together on April 16 and see if we can get people to pay attention. And, and it's been very successful. You know, it's hard to measure success, but um, it, all the indicators are that we're making inroads into uh, improvement in advanced care planning. For those of you who don't know, the date of April 16 was specifically chosen because it's the day after tax day. And we know that Ben Franklin reminded us that nothing is life, nothing in life is certain but death and taxes. So if you're curious why the heck is it April 16, uh, there you go. And of course, today is the 16th, so we've only got two months to go. So hopefully this is a, this is a very timely um, chat my experience is really now is when the work gets done um, because it's it's coming up it's fresh and people are excited um, some of that uh, first of the, of the year cobwebs are, are brushed off so um, looking forward to uh, seeing what you guys do um, just a few other comments um, one of the the perennial themes of uh, NHDD is to lead by example um, maybe we will do a poll I don't think we should but I'm willing to bet that not 100% of the folks that have joined this call have an advanced care plan done. Um, I see Patty making a massive smirk, um, and because she knows. Um, and so, at a minimum, if you do nothing else for National Healthcare Decisions Day, do your own advanced care plan and challenge uh, your family and friends to do the same. Um, the other thing I, I remind people is to really aim very high, but be very satisfied with anything at all. Uh, again, this is really hard stuff to measure. If we do our job right, there won't be ethics consults about these patients. So success will be creating the negative, which is a little hard to fathom, but trust me, that is, uh, is exactly the success we're looking for. And then finally, um, just to keep in mind, although the conversation project is really focused um, on end of life care, National Healthcare Decisions Day is broader. Um, Obviously, a huge portion of advanced care planning is about end of life care, but um, we're broader than that. We we care about any kind of health care wishes. There was mention of mental health, um, religious choices, any of that stuff should be part of the conversation about uh, advanced care planning. Um, so don't feel like it should be limited to end of life, although obviously that's the most important. So. Um, that's the little bit that I want to share at the moment. Obviously, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions on the website. There's some more history and uh, other detail if, if you want it. And otherwise, um, I'm fairly easy to find on my website uh, for the firm, williamsmullen.com. Um, and if you ever need anything, do not hesitate to reach out to me. Um, I am absolutely passionate about this, and I will help anybody with anything if I can. Thank you so much, Nathan. Really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing a little bit of the, the background um, and just being so open to always being available for folks to talk with. 
Uh, we truly appreciate that. You know, we are all about conversations um, and we are, we've also changed a little bit of our messaging as well. So we know that it's important at end of life, but it's actually important through the end of life. And so we've uh, updated and adapted as, as our work has gone along and as similar to as National Healthcare Decision Day has as well, and really focusing on those conversations that go into um, those plans. And so we're really excited to talk about the power of conversations um, that you can have and rally folks around this day. And so we know that a lot of you are thinking about this and some of you already have some plans. I've, I've um, heard a lot of really good um, individuals telling me what they're planning on doing already. So I'm going to just open this up and we're going to do a little bit of a uh, chatter fall. Um, let me just answer the question. Oh, oh thank you. And uh, Nathan answered Angela's question. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to, Mar uh, Marsha, I just wanted to um, thank you for being here. I saw that you had lost um, your father and I, I appreciate that you're being here. And I know this is near and dear to your heart. Um, and I can appreciate that it's probably near and close to everybody's heart. Um, so just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, so this chat waterfall we're going to ask you to do is um, take a minute. And I'm literally just going to give folks a time. Don't hit enter. But in chat, I want you to write, what are you thinking about? or potentially already planning for to do for National Healthcare Decisions Day. So go ahead and type that in. If you are here and you're not even thinking about it yet because that's why you're here, maybe there's something you want to explore or a question you have, go ahead and pop that in the chat. Before you hit enter, don't hit enter yet. Um, we want people to just have time to think before all the chat comes through. And so think about that and go ahead and write it in. I'll let you know when to hit send, okay? So I'm going to give folks maybe another 20 seconds and then I'll, I'll ask you to hit send. If you have, don't worry about it. That's totally fine too, but hang on. Oh, and you, you can, that's, that's Ronnie, no apologies necessary at all. All right, go ahead. If you've got something in, I'm going to ask you all to go ahead and hit send. Um, this is what we call it a chat waterfall. And so you're going to, it's going to be impossible to read all this, but the reason we're doing this is so we've got all of these plans in and the questions here. And so I'm going to ask um, our, our team to help kind of mine some of this. And so I'm going to spend a few minutes um, just kind of scrolling up to some of the plans that, um, that people are, are doing. So, Jean, I see you're here to get new ideas. Um, this is great. Rhonda, uh, I see you're developing a toolkit for all your social workers. Um, Rhonda, it's great to see you on here um, for your advanced directives fair. I love it. Toolkits being developed. I'm trying to keep up. This is good. Um, Bonnie, you're soliciting some speaking engagements. This is excellent. Tammy, I'm hoping today, I see you undecided. Um, I'm hoping that some of these ideas that folks are already starting to think in their head um, is gonna help you as well. Terry's getting BIPAC people to have conversations and complete the document. You're doing a, a two for one. I love it, Terry. And it's so, I'm very, very excited to see you here um, in NYC, I love it. I see some folks doing some media engagement. This is excellent. I'm looking for any questions. Mickey has a wonderful program, Realities of Advanced Medical Interventions. Lunch and Learns, I love that. Karen Adams, starting small, community newsletter and internal education. Um, I, Nathan always says this, if you do one thing, starting small, it doesn't matter, one thing. Um, and that to me doesn't sound small, that sounds pretty, pretty hefty. Um, but if you affect change with one person, that, that's, all we, that's all that matters. And so um, no matter big or small, I don't want anyone to feel that they have to um, lasso the moon. All right, so um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to go back to this in just a little bit. Um, so thank you for sharing plans. I really appreciate that. 
Um, I'm just going to ask one last question, then we're going to um, bring Tony in um, and introduce him and, and some of the messaging research. Um, I'm curious just to see what's the mood in your community right now. So individuals, we've got a mix of groups um, from those that are in healthcare, those that are in the community. So areas on aging, the VA, we've got a lot of great representation here. Individuals who are patient advocates uh, or consultants doing this work on their own. As you're, um, you, you've got the hand on the pulse of your community. What is the mood right now? Um, how do you, how, how are they feeling? Do you think they're, they're ready for this? What's, what's, what are folks feeling right now as they're starting to, to get things back up in person? Go ahead and pop that in the chat. You hear squeaking, it is my mouse squeaking as I'm scrolling down all of these wonderful resources and, and um, ideas that you all have. Okay, Barbara, exhaustion. Okay. Tired in Seattle. Not sleepless, but tired. And I would imagine probably sleepless as well. Mm, ready to listen about the best things they can do. All right. Cautious. Keep popping the mood. I think it's important for us to kind of look at that and understand the mood in your community and um, understand what people can handle right now. And we are hoping that NHCD, some of the ideas that we're going to be sharing with each other and what are already being shared, how do we make this light accessible and approachable? Um, and a lot of what uh, we're going to hear from Tony is just that. Um, and so we have heard a lot of adaptations to current times. Um, we've, we've been adapting our resources as we go. Um, NHD has adapted, advanced care planning has adapted, um, and there's a continuum and a lot of discussion about how uh, it's changing over time and conversations are really, really shining through. Um, and um, it's about adapting and learning. And so we have here with us um, Dr. Anthony Bach, and I'm going to pop a picture up and we're going to quickly pull this down because we're going to talk face to face uh, with Tony. Um, Tony is a professor of medicine at the University of Washington um, Division of Oncology. And his research on patient physician communication has been funded by several um, uh, foundations that are re really well known National Cancer Institute, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, Gordon Betty Moore, and many others. Um, Tony was a faculty scholar in um, the project for, on death in America, and he co founded Vital Talk, which is a 501c3 foundation that's focused really on clinical skills training for serious illness conversations. Um, he's produced a lot of videos, um, apps for, for folks, and video, video blogs on communication skills. And so he's got a lot of experience um, and just has learned so much in, in the work that he's done. And so we're really thrilled that Tony is here with us. Um, he is the principal investigator of the Message Lab, which is a national initiative that's funded by uh, funders of, of the Conversation Project as well, the Cambia Health Foundation and the John A. Hartford Foundation. Um, and the Message Lab folks have been uh, aligning, creating and aligning public messaging for serious illness care uh, with groups like us. He's been working directly with our fearless leader, Kate DeBartolo, who's on the call. And so Tony's going to share with us um, a little bit about messaging research. Uh, Kate, um, Chrissy, do you mind popping these slides off so we can do a little face to face? Hello, Tony, as we, we get you get get you live and we'll get our slides off. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Would you, I, I'm so excited that you're here. Do you mind sharing um, an overview of some of your re messaging research um, that we can learn from? Uh, well, thank you. And it's really a privilege to speak to the Conversation Project community because you guys have been doing this for a long time. And furthermore, what you, what, the conversation project has done recently with those new conversation guides that you showed, Patty, I think it's really terrific work that is really backed by research and I think can really have potential to change the culture. Uh, you know, one of the things we were looking at in terms of messaging is how do we introduce all of these topics to the public, right? Like if we look at what's happened over the past couple of decades, the number of people who fill out advanced directives hasn't gone up. The number of people who know what palliative care is hasn't gone up. Like, it feels like we've hit kind of a wall. And so we were trying to figure out what's going on here and what could we do to shake that up? And so that's why we turn to messaging research that is more like consumer research than traditional medical research. So we weren't 
we were studying like regular people who are not necessarily people with a serious illness, not necessarily people who get treated for cancer, who are right in the thick of it, not bereaved, you know, spouses or anything like that. And we found a couple of really important, surprising things. And this now represents a body of research over the past, you know, several years. And um, here are a couple of things. One is like the terminology we use is not known to most lay people who are not connected with this in some way. So we did a whole series of focus groups before COVID and during COVID. And after the last focus group, the um, focus group moderator said, uh, you know, not one person used the term advanced care planning. What do you think about that? And we were like, oh yeah. That, so it, it actually is that even the term advanced care planning that you guys are so familiar with, like most lay people don't really know what know what you're talking about. Um, and then the other thing that we've learned with this research is that people who haven't done advanced care planning, when you explain to them what it is, right? You like go through the, and basically we did that by telling stories with people. The people who haven't done it, they're not people who have never heard of what advanced care planning is. They think they know what it is and they don't want to do it, right? So it's not just a matter of we need to tell them what it is and how great it is. It's that we need to overcome some barriers. And one of the barriers is that they are um, concerned that if they make decisions now, they will be locked into them later. They are worried. Our focus groups overwhelmingly said that they equated advanced care planning with having a DNR. And so I think those, I know, you know, and I know what you guys do with the conversation project. That is not what you're intending. But I think it's important to know that that's the misconception that's out there. And so I think those are um, important things to bear in mind. The other thing that I'll just say that because of Nancy's question, you know, this question about this January 20. 22 article, this, you know, top experts are questioning the value of advanced care planning. That has been a big discussion in the medical community. Yeah. And I think what that is referring I'm on to live with the camera. Sorry. Oh, is that Cheryl? Are you trying to say something? Oh, oh, oh got it. What what that article is is talking about is a viewpoint. Um, that uh, was recently in a top medical journal that summarized a bunch of advanced care planning studies. And in these studies, they tried to get people to fill out forms that talked about medical decisions far, far, far in the future, not things that they were ever facing. And then they tried to see if those decision-making processes and documents influence care over the next couple of years. It's a short-term study, right? Like it's not long follow-up. But, you know, the number, there have been a, a few studies out there that have showed that just filling out a document does not necessarily change what happens to you in terms of medical care. And so I think the caution is, is that many people, because they are so um, new to what talking about a serious illness and what you want means, we have to actually instill in them the idea that they could actually have a say in their care. There were a lot of people in our focus groups who were surprised at the idea that they could even have a preference about their care, that if they could even say to the doctor what, what they thought they wanted because their index story, their assumed story coming into these focus groups is that having that conversation about serious illness is this, you are sitting in a dingy conference room. A doctor that you've never seen before walks in and tells you that you have to pull the plug on your, you know, spouse, mother, daughter, whatever, right? That's their idea of what a serious illness conversation is. And that is a pretty scary vision. And so I think it's really important for us to know that kind of detoxifying these conversations, making them friendly conversations with people you care about over the kitchen table, over meal, during a walk, that don't necessarily result in a decision or a document right then. Those conversations are really important and those help people be more equipped for times when they need to, when they actually are in the you know, uh, shoes of a decision maker and need to make a uh, need to make a decision. So, you know, Mary Tanetti's thing about age friendly healthcare, which is the what matters campaign. 
This is reinforcing the idea that what's important is learning to talk about what matters to you. And that might be more important than actually try to get somebody to sign a document. So those are some things I wanted to start with, Patty, and, and uh, I'll, I'll see if there are questions or um, ask if you have any questions about this. I love that. Thank you, Tony. I mean, you've given us a lot of food for thought in terms of what's how, how things have shifted and what we've learned from from actual people and from from solid research. And so I, I think um, Eve had a, had a question, had a question or, or could kind of maybe turn this into a bigger question. Um, and maybe what are some one or two talking points um, that are especially important for people here who are looking to help spread this with communities. So not just, so she, you mentioned healthcare providers. I might yeah. take it a little step further. Um, and so what are, what are those key take home points that are especially important for people here as they are trying to um, invoke these conversations or invite people in uh, to talk? Yeah, yeah, great, Eve, great question. Thank you for that. And I will talk about healthcare providers and then I'll talk about everybody else, regular people. I think what has happened with healthcare providers is that many of them have learned to see advanced care planning as kind of a check the box, ex box exercise. And so I think the talking point for health providers is that if you have a brief conversation with your patient about what matters to them in their healthcare, that can serve you well into the future and it can help you know and know what they want and help you talk to them later. You can say, remember when we had that discussion? Remember when you told me about this? And it rehearses the patient for those big discussions later. When, if you're talking to lay people about um, advanced care planning, I think the talking point is that um, you can have a say in your care if you have prepared a little bit. So the preparation that you need to do is you need to talk to your family or friend about what's important to you in your life, what's important to you in your health care. Um, and, and those are conversations that you can have now. If you, if you can sign a form, great, but you don't have to sign a form just to have a conversation. You know, a lot of people and older people especially are worried about getting into binding contracts, right? So I think what you can do to get out of that is say, hey, I just wanna learn more about you. So if the time ever came up that someone turned to me with a question about what you would want it, I'll have some idea, right? So does that help Eve? I'd be happy if you wanna come on screen and ask a follow-up if I didn't address your question. I'm gonna say that works, but I can't speak for you, Eve. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Eve. And I think that was a larger question. So as, as folks are sitting here, um, oh, great, Terry, Terry's mentioning she incorporated the question to your vis vision board uh, yesterday. So there's been a lot of excellent chatter. I'm sure I'm missing a lot of, of, of points here. Um, well, you know, um, that she Wanda, uses, oh, oh yep. go ahead, you go. No, no, I was just gonna say, Mindy's saying she uses the phrase that advanced care plans, 80% conversations, 20% documents. Conversations must be ongoing. Um, so really that totally. heavy focus on conversations. And what we would say uh, that Wanda. Oh, so Wanda was talking, Wanda was citing a New York Times opinion piece that um, looks at a case study of where advanced care planning was a little complicated, but what she stresses is the value of having in the moment conversations with patients and families and the importance of having people oriented towards that. Um, so, you know, these are not decisions that you can make all way in the future, but you can start to learn to talk about them. Because I think what you guys are doing in the conversation project is, is really, I see the meta message here as you can have a conversation about what's important to you and it doesn't make you sad. It doesn't mean that things are over. It doesn't mean you're giving up. What it means is you care enough to listen that you will be around to support somebody you will be around to be there if things get tough. Nancy, advanced care COP requirement. Don't worry about it. If you have any kind of a conversation that refers to medical care you want in the future, that counts as an advanced directive conversation and a provider can bill for that. So the providers are all wigged out about, oh, we have to have every single one of these boxes checked to you know, uh, say that this was a real advanced conversation a directive conversation, that is not true. 
you can have any kind of conversation. You could have a conver a classic conversation project conversation with a patient based on one of the guides that you can download free from the internet and that would count as an advanced directive conversation and it would be super useful if a doctor put a, a couple of bullets about that conversation into the medical record for the future um, that would be incredibly valuable tony let me ask you um and and i want i don't want to take up all your time but i so appreciate the conversations we're having so I'm going to bring it back around to National Healthcare Decisions Day. So a lot of the groups, uh, what folks have been sharing, and I'm, I'm pointing to chat, so up in chat, I'm seeing some great plans and, and thoughts. What would be, if you had one suggestion as folks are preparing events or activities or social media um, bits and pieces, um, putting a table out for information and, and conversations, what should they think about as they're preparing uh, to support their community members around National Healthcare Decisions Day? Yeah, I think uh, I wonder, and of course, you guys are the experts on National Healthcare Decisions Day, but I wonder about helping support people to have conversations so they are ready for just ready to make good decisions. Right? Because um, I think one of the things that we have learned over the past 20 years um, is that, you know, the bioethicists really taught us the importance of parsing out these different kinds of decisions. And I think and I think when we go to lay people, I think it's very different than when we are talking about the classic bioethics situation where there is a lot of medical knowledge on all the parties because it's been a super complicated situation. You know, I think what we are increasingly seeing is um, in consumer based situations in uh, situations where people don't necessarily have a lot of medical information. They often have misconceptions about what advanced care planning really is or means. Um, I think just getting people to start talking and understanding the value of that, that is actually hugely important. And I think we have not um, stressed that enough in the past. Great. Thank you. Um, any other questions or thoughts? Um, I'm also um, can pull in Kate and Nathan, if you want to jump in with anything um, as well. Um, anything, anything re remaining for Tony? Um, you all can, anyone can pop off mute as well. Hey, Patty, it's Nathan. Um, one of the things that I think is so great about National Healthcare Decisions Day is it serves as an opportunity to take some of the burden off of people who just don't know how to start the conversation. They feel like it's this big, heavy topic. Uh, it never seems to be the right moment uh, for any number of reasons. And you, you you can just point to the day in the same way that we talk about breast cancer in September and heart month and you know, all that kind of stuff. You just say, look, I don't know how to bring this up either, but this is the day that's been set for it. Why don't we go to the website? Why don't we look at one of the conversation starters and just see what happens? And my experience has been that if you can get your loved ones to just, or get others to get their loved ones uh, to just start the conversation, then it just sort of cascades from there. Uh, it's really just that we just have to flip the switch. And that's what this whole initiative is about, is just making sure that there's lots of levers all over the place so that somebody will just hit one of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, Nathan, I think that is so true because I think that there is this vibe out there that, and I see this with patients all the time and families, that if we talk about something bad, it will it will happen. Or if we talk about some something that is serious, Everybody will be so sad. It'll be like a disaster, even though nothing has happened. Right? And so I feel like we have to change the kind of cultural narrative around that to say that talking about these important things with people you love that brings people closer. That has benefits because it gives people peace of mind. It can help you know each other better. And we have to start talking about those benefits instead of stressing the disasters on the other end. You know, when we first started out in bioethics, I did a lot of this too. You know, we used to talk about all the disaster situations that people would get into if they did not do like advanced care planning or do not resuscitate orders. And I'll tell you what the market research has shown us very clearly is that, that backfire. Talking about disasters backfires. We need to start talking about the, the short term and long term benefits of having these conversations and doing these work, doing this work because people scaring people hasn't been it has not been effective, right? We need mm -hmm. to start talking about the benefits, and we need to tell stories about the benefits. 
I, I love this that. So some of those points that you pulled up. Oh, uh, go ahead. We've got someone who wanted to jump is, in. Well, this is Kate. I was just going to say, oh, yeah. hey, everyone, um, we've certainly seen the testimonials go a long way. When you have an example of somebody who can share that they did have a conversation and it brought them closer, it doesn't even have to mean that a death has even occurred yet. Just, I was nervous about bringing this up with my mom, but when we did, I thought we had such like a loving conversation. I feel better prepared or my siblings and I feel more prepared for what to do. Those kinds of stories can be really good to be collecting and sharing. Yes. I think Nathan, your idea of kind of helping people hear this message eight times, eight ways. So it might be in your newsletter and then on social media, and then you have an event and it's just kind of a, it doesn't only have to happen on April 16th. The reason we have this call early is that there's stuff we can be doing to kind of have that little slow drip to normalize it. And I think some people's programming might be more towards helping individuals have conversations and other people's programming might be more of that like culture shift to normalize advanced care planning and both are good, but they might be slightly different in approach. Um, so yeah. you might be thinking again, those testimonials of who's well respected in your community who might be willing to share their story because that normalizes it for someone else. Right. And then your other programming might be somebody Somebody just got a tough diagnosis. They need help figuring out how to talk about it. How can we help you with that? Yeah, and and Kate, I just want to capitalize on one other thing that you kind of alluded to, which is that it's really important for you to talk about a range of stories. If all your stories about end of life, there is quite a bit of data mm -hmm. that there's a large segment of the public that will just go click off. So you really need to, even though I get that end of life is super important and it has a lot of gravity, especially for a certain group of people, that certain group of people, when you talk to, when you research consumers is pretty small. So I think it's really important to have conversations about your medical care, conversations about what's important, conversations about what happens if you get a serious illness. And those, you do not need to add the phrase end of life to every single one of those things. That actually, there is a liability that comes with that. And even though I know that the conversation project wants to support people through the end of life, just remember that the end of life, those, those are charged words for consumers. And so you need to be a little bit careful about how you um, do them. And Angela, you know what, the, your ex experience showing video clips of gone wrong scenarios, you know, that is actually what we learned in the, in the educational literature when we were building Vital Talk, which is our training for clinicians. Like everybody has seen so many examples of things gone badly. You do not need to keep showing them because actually what you show them in video is so vivid, they remember it. What you need to show them is the conversation that went well, the conversation that uncovered a silver lining, the con conversation that where someone said, wow, that was not so bad, right? Like those are the kinds of conversations that we need to get into people's heads. And, you know, I want to um, echo that and give a, a great uh, shout out to Kate. Uh, hopefully you guys are seeing my monthly messages. And I think I was just frustrated this last month because my first cut at the message to everybody was three very frustrating things I saw in the course of three weeks. And Kate's like, no, you got, you got to do something different. And so I did, I took a completely different turn, but it just goes to show how easy it is for all of us to fall into that negativity thinking. And um, so the one thing that I would just recommend that you do is really, really, really focus hard on those success stories. It's, it's, it's one of these things that many times they're so subtle, you don't see them as a success that is because they are a success so when you have somebody who comes in they haven't got an advanced care plan and the the care unfolds without incident that is a success put it in a notebook jot yourself a memo and use that to show how it works you can still be frustrated about the negative stuff just don't share it <laughs> And it's okay to have the negative concept. That's okay. You know what? One That's of the right. things that really does resonate with folks is who's your person. That's so right. So who who is going to who who can you trust? And it, it goes back to some of those principles, Tony, that you were talking about. Who's your person in case something does happen to you? And we had that conversation with my son uh, when he was going off to college because it's really important that no, you, you turn eighteen, you're no longer um, we're we're no longer your automatic decision makers, and so. Let's talk about that. Um, and so we've, we've found in, in, in a lot of the groups that are here, um, we've learned so much from everybody that, that's been sharing in chat. 
um, and really that proxy and that healthcare decision maker. And those are the conversations that are really relatable. We've got a lot of groups that are reaching millennials and talking about um, proxy and really focusing on those types of conversations. Um, I just circled some of the some of the key things, and then we're gonna I'm gonna loop back around to groups. I see uh, the fantastic chat that sh that's that's going on right now. If there's something you want to learn from each other, and anybody wants to take themselves off mute, we can do that. Um, Tony, I just want to thank you for for everything that you've been sharing because you, some of the key highlights um, that's popped in, in what Kate and Nathan are also saying. So you can have a say um, in your care, aspirational, um, and lead with the positive. Um, friend, in that friendly tone, trust. So who are those trusted people um, that you can actually go to? And it's not necessarily those that you might think. It might not be a family member. It might be um, your best friend. It might be somebody um, in your faith community. Um, what's important and what really matters. Um, I know you, you hammered that home um, in some of the points you made. Um, and then a range. And so a range of stories. And I'm really, I, I'm internalizing that a lot because I feel like I, I tell the same stories over and over again. Um, so I appreciate you sharing some of those, like some, some, of, there was many more things that you shared, but some of the key, key highlights. Um, so, uh, I'm going to just, I'm going to, let me go back to folks. Anybody uh, want to share plans that they're doing or any questions you have? And then in the next minute or two, I'm going to actually, um, move us to a call to action, um, and start wrapping up the call, but I want to just open it up and see if there's anybody wants to share that's on the line, anything that's resonating or plans that you have. You're all about casual and popping off mute here. Well, Patty, let me chime in with something that maybe Tony can reflect on. I think one of the ways to capture younger people, uh, however you want to define younger people, is that this should just be part of your daily toolbox. Um, you know, I talk about the fact I'm an endurance athlete. Every day I put myself on a bike, I've got a fairly decent chance of either hitting a tree or getting hit by a car, you know. I shouldn't ever ride without it, just in the same way we should never drive a car without our seatbelt on. It doesn't mean that it's 100% effective, but it should just be part of our, like, human being toolkit. Um, Tony, have you guys talked about any of that kind of language, just sort of, it's just a safety net sort of thing? Yeah, so uh, I don't know that I know exactly about that toolkit, but what I can tell you, uh, about one of the ways that the young generation differs from the baby boomer generation. I'm here, I'm talking about research that compared baby boomers to generation Z, was that baby boomers were seeing kind of our current situation with COVID as part of a journey. Like for some of them, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. For some baby boomers, they're like, ooh, I'm not so sure where the journey is going. Whereas the Gen Z people, they really felt like COVID had been a force that had disrupted their lives and had knocked them for a loop. So they didn't see the journey so much. And so I think the whole toolkit approach or the, you know, tools for living approach, that might really resonate for younger people because uh, I think they are experiencing this differently. I mean, this is a group of people now that basically have grown up with a daily crisis. Like they have had a different experience living in the world and with the news than older people is what this firm was explaining to me. And so I, I think your approach is definitely one worth um, trying out. So thank you for that, Nathan. Um, Kate. This is Kate, yeah. I just put an article in the chat for folks that was in the Washington Post recently about younger folks having these conversations. It's actually not just about COVID, but but that idea of like, natural disasters, terrorist activity, pandemics, we've found on the Conversation Project website in the last year or so, the under 35 category is the like the largest group on our website now. There's been a real shift of age wow. of who's been engaging with content. And I think there's a real benefit to going to audiences. This again gets to kind of culture shift of you know, articles on how to engage grandparents and younger generations engaging parents or, or who to approach about this. There's kind of different approaches. Yeah. And uh, right, thank you, Wanda, Wanda, I'm not sure if I know the, uh, if I don't know if I know that there's research that says engagement, you know, these conversations and engagement in self care. I am imagining that you were talking about self care, kind of mental health self care, but I'm not totally. Sure, but so I don't know if I can make that connection. Um, I will say that I think one of the things that Generation Z is teaching us, though, is that the value of 
talking about mental health and how we are all doing in an explicit way, I actually feel like they are demonstrating that publicly and they are actually showing all of us how to talk about that. And in a way, it might be that we can take a, a cue from their courage and honesty and authenticity about that. And I could totally imagine um, using that with a young audience. I love that. These are great points. Thank you so much. So I'm going to actually kind of wrap us back up. Um, I've enjoyed this so much. I wish we could keep going. Um, and I also would love to pull more folks in. But I'm conscious that I want to do a little bit of a leaving in action. Um, and so as you're planning for NHGD, I'm going to ask Christy to pop the slides back on. Tony, Nathan, um, Kate, everybody who's been popping in and chat, thank you so much um, for this wonderful conversation. It's been fantastic. And Tony, you're a whiz at uh, making, you, you can see the questions as they come and you're reacting to them. So you clearly have done this multiple times and multitasking. Um, Chrissy, if you can pop the slides back on, I'm going to give some folks some food for thought uh, for the next two months. I can't believe it's almost here, National Healthcare Decisions Day. Um, and we're going to we're going to share a little bit about um, some of our plans um, and some of what uh, we hope we're going to make it easier and a lighter lift um, for you all for the next couple months. And so I'm just going to scroll. Awesome, thank you, Chrissy. Um, and I just want to thank Chrissy because before I forget at the end because she's a whiz at and really running this whole thing. So thank you, Chrissy. So I just wanted, we want this to be a light lift and not, not ease the burden. Uh, I first spoke to Tony about doing this, this call and I was running my mouth a mile a minute and Tony was like, what's the call to action? And I was asking all these different things. And Tony, I loved how you said, keep it light, keep it simple. Because as we saw the mood as folks were sharing, there's exhaustion and tiredness. Last year, this slide shows kind of what we did for National Healthcare Decisions week. So the week leading up to National Healthcare Decisions Day, it just happened to be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday was the 16th. This had resonated with folks last year and a couple folks this year had asked to see this. I'm only showing us because this we as the conversation project decided to have themes each day that we would focus our social media messages for. And so we started with you. So the first day was starting internally and it moved on. And so I show this if you're looking for some themes but I'm cautious because there's a lot of action here. And so you may want to think about how can we make this a light lift um, and make this a little bit lighter for folks. Um, but we used those themes last year. This year, what we're actually going to do is our, our overall arching theme is talk about it. Um, we actually maybe should say talk and listen because listening is as utmost important um, in a conversation. Um, but we really want to get people talking, not just writing, and as we as we talked about today, talking about it. And so we're going to be sharing over the next two months content across our social media platforms here and our newsletter. So these are just little pictures. And so if you don't follow us and don't get our newsletter, I encourage you to do so. Um, what you all can do for those that are helping your individual uh, personal circles, your social circles, your community at a larger network. I know some of you are working across your state. Um, use and repurpose our content. Um, this is what we're here for. Um, if you use our content, you want to give us a little shout out and give us credit, uh, by all means do that. But we are going to be creating over the next two months content that's going to be easily lifted. So you don't have to create brand new content. Um, we have existing contents, obviously the guides that we have that you all know and we showed earlier. Uh, we're going to be developing some more blogs. So one of the ideas is 10 easy things you can do in 10 minutes or less to get a conversation going. Um, and we'll list some steps that people can do. You can take some of those and tweet them out. Um, we'll have a social media toolkit as well. Um, I know there's folks that are developing their own. Um, this is going to be on our NHDD resource page. So that link in the bottom is where that lives. Um, so keep an eye on that and use and repurpose as you can. So here are our, our handles for our social media. If you aren't already following us, please follow us. Um, anything that you also create, tag us because we're going to help push it out. We'll use our platforms to get the message out for what you're doing as well. So you can also, so you can use our content, but I really encourage you um, to pull together your own story. As we heard, stories are really what makes a big difference. It's that aspirational moment. So we know that each individual that's here on the call, you have your own stories that really are gonna help motivate folks. Um, use the mess messaging principles uh, that you heard today and talk that up in, in what you do. Um, 
we encourage you to stay and share connected. So I see folks sharing email um, addresses and I love it. And so it doesn't end here where we have, we have a Facebook group. So you can use our networks, whatever networks you have, but we do have a conversation project Facebook group. It's specifically for community champions. So if you are spreading the word, so not just for general lay people, we have our general Facebook page for that, but this is a discussion group. There's about, I don't know, 360 um, plus folks on there now. We want you to interact on that. We've, we do a lot of push out on there, but use that um, to, to network with each other. Um, go to our Get Involved page and you can see the map that we have. People have been putting their pins. We encourage you to put your pin so you can look up in, um, in California to see who else is doing something in your state. And um, lastly, whoop, just going to pause. Don't forget to listen. This is a fantastic quote and I'm forgetting, Kate, where, um, where we got this um, from a doctor who has done some work with us. When you listen generously to people, they can hear truth in themselves often for the first time. And I absolutely love this quote. Um, so we also make sure that that folks are um, listening and, and not just talking. And so um, the last thing, uh, Rhonda, this call is being recorded. And so that's going to be on our page. We have our call page. Um, it's going to be on that page. So you'll see the quotes and slides from today are all going to be there for your use. Um, the last little bit here. We had some great testimonial um, from someone who used our resources. They had um, elderly grandparents who lived in a different state, um, nobody to take care of them. She suggested to her grandparents li living, going to assisted living or having an aide in their home, but they refused. Um, she, they had some additional problems. She said she viewed our conversation project guides on the flight to Colorado, and when she got there, she decided to change her usual approach to the issue. She started asking questions instead of telling them how worried she was. The questions that came straight out of our materials, she said our guide was really helpful to start that two-way conversation. So I share part of this testimonial with you because it really is important um, shifting our approach and we've been doing that across the years of the conversation project. Um, so we're gonna, we're, we're celebrating our 10 year anniversary coming up. It coincides nicely with NHDD, our 10 year anniversary of our resources um, on uh, being available on our website. So we might reach out to some of you and ask for testimonials to see what, how this work has made a difference in your life. So keep an eye on that. And so I'm one minute over and I apologize um, because I'd hate to take up extra time. Um, the last thing I'm gonna ask, and I thank our funders, if, if you have time to stick around, Chrissy is gonna put a link in the chat. We have a three question survey. We're all about improving. So just let us know how this went what we can do better next time. And I just want to thank everyone for joining us. And um, we're really excited to see what you are thinking about and planning for NHDD. And we are here with you all along the way. Um, so please reach out to us and um, use us as a support system and use each other. So thank you all.